Hey everyone, Chang here and welcome to my channel. Now, in previous videos, I focused a lot on concepts. Every now and then I touch on techniques. Today is one of those days. This video, I'm gonna focus on a technique. Now normally a technique is for a specific topic, a specific uh, exact math concepts in order to solve a problem easier. Well, today I wanna go on a more generalized path, right? Today we're gonna talk about this. This is a proof technique. Now. Proof is a very scary thing. Every time we think about proof, we're thinking about our from point A to point B, and then we have to know every single step to reach point A to point B. And it doesn't help because usually when we're introduced to proof, at least for me personally, I was introduced to it in geometry, where it seems like I just had to know how each and every one of them justified each other progressively before I can even start on working through and answering the proof. That's not necessarily the case. The general concept of proof is very simple. You have this result you really want to show works generally, not just for specific cases. And whatever happens, you just have to formulate an argument, a logical way to show that that's true. That's it. That's all proof is. So that means that that single straightforward proof that we normally see is not the only way to go about it. There's a variety of different ways to approach proving something. And one of the common one, well more common once you study higher level math is this one. It's a reducio ad absurdum and I probably mispronounced it because you know it's Latin and uh -huh, don't speak Latin. But basically you can sort of tell what this stands for. The idea is that you're reducing reduce to the absurd. That's basically what it means, right? So the idea is that your argument eventually will run into some weird contradiction and hence the title. There's actually several names for this and you'll see them in different textbooks and different books in general, I don't know, literature, but you have the Latin of course, you have the English, but the English of course has different ones as well. You have reduced to the absurd or you also have proof by contradiction. And another one, which threw me off in the beginning because I had no idea what it meant, was good faith proof. Okay, so these are all different names and I'm sure there might be more that I've missed. But basically, the strategy with this proof is the same thing. So, let's talk about the strategy. The strategy of why this technique or how this technique work is actually quite simple. There's a reason it's called good faith argument. You're going to assume the opposite condition. So whatever you're trying to prove, you're going to assume the original condition is the opposite. Okay. And then afterwards, with that assumption, you're going to work through the problem. And here's where it gets a little iffy and it actually takes practice and experience, right? There's no set straight path on how I'm supposed to work around it. But the idea is that first you assume the opposite condition, then you're just going to work with the problem, work and finagle it to the degree that you run into a contradiction. Now here's the key. While you're working on the problem itself, each and every one of those steps must be logically supported. It can't just be, I decide this and therefore I'm doing this and then without any like backing or any, I guess you could say logical sense. If you can show that everything you've done is complete logically sound, right? And you run into a contradiction, that's where the third one comes in. The only way that contradiction occur is because the initial assumption, the initial condition that you assumed doesn't work, right? That's the whole, I guess you could say structure of this argument is that I assumed in good faith that whatever the opposite condition is, is true. That's just a basic assumption, all right? I am taking it for gospel is true and so I'm gonna work with it. I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work and all of a sudden I hit a contradiction but everything I did makes complete sense. But I still have a contradiction. So what happened? Well, if everything I did makes sense up to the contradiction, then the only thing that could potentially have led to this contradiction is that initial assumption. That means that initial assumption was false, right? That's how it works. And one of the most famous one is the idea that square root two is an irrational number. 
right? And it's built on the idea that you assume the opposite. Um, square root two is a rational number and you run into a contradiction. I did a whole video on it. It's extremely famous, a classic. You should definitely take your time to look at it. I'm gonna leave a link in the description down below. So let's look at and use this on an actual problem. All right, so for our first problem, and here's the thing with proof. Once again, the other scary part is that you have to understand what problems are asking and definitions, mathematical definitions of specific vocabularies. So this one, prove that there's no such thing as a smallest positive rational number, okay? Smallest positive means that, you know, I guess you could say as you get closer and closer to zero, that number is smaller and smaller. So what it's saying, there's no one number that is just the smallest and there's nothing else smaller than that. That's why it's called the smallest positive. Rational, rational is any numbers, I guess for an easy way to go about it, any numbers that could be written as a fraction. So prove that there's no such thing as the smallest positive rational number. So if we're gonna use this proof by contradiction, right, this reduced to the absurd, we're gonna have to be assuming the opposite. Since this is saying that we're, we want to prove that no such thing exists, let's just assume it does, right? So we're gonna assume, and then here's where it gets a little interesting, so hopefully uh, you guys can follow along, right? It's gonna be using variables, but luckily it's gonna be fairly simple. Assume, let's just say r, this variable r, right, is the smallest. Okay, that is our initial assumption. It's completely opposite of what we're trying to prove. So in good faith, we're assuming this is true. Okay, so if that's the case, that means that r, since it, it is the smallest rational number, it's gonna be greater than zero, right? It has to be greater than zero because anything that's zero doesn't really qualify as smallest positive, right? So it's greater than zero, great. But here's the thing, if I were to divide this by two, right, what happens? Well, any number, usually, positive, right? If you divide it by two, it's technically smaller. So r over two is usually smaller than r. Yeah, right? I mean, you can think of any number you want. If you divide it by two, that resulting number is a lot smaller than the original number. So in this case, what do we have? We have, uh, well, zero is less than r, and we know that r over two is less than r. Well, we also know that r over two is not zero, right? Because there's no way in any way you can divide a number by another number and get zero. So in this case, r over two is less than r. So zero is less than r over two is less than r. Meaning basically this new number, it, which is basically r divided by two cut in half, right? It's smaller than r, but still greater than zero. But there it is. We have a contradiction because we made this initial assumption that r is the smallest number, right? There's no other number smaller than r. But if we divide it by two and r over two, any fraction divided by two is still technically a fraction. So this is still a rational number, but it's smaller than r. But this can't be smaller than r because we assumed that r was the smallest. So therefore we run into a contradiction. Well, this reasoning, this idea that when we get a number and we divide it by two, that resulting number is smaller. That is absolute at this point. Well, if that's true and this thing is true, then the only reason we ran into a contradiction is because this assumption right here, that r itself is the smallest, right, is false. That's the only way we can correct this contradiction. So, since that's the case, this is an incorrect assumption. That means, well, the original one is true, right? That there is no such thing as the smallest positive rational number, right? There's always gonna be something that's smaller. Every time we deem one is the smallest, there's gonna be something that's smaller. All right, so let's look at another one. Here's a different one, quite interesting. There does not exist three even numbers such that the sum is 31. So, 
If we're going to use that same technique, once again, assume the opposite. Assume that there is, right, that the three number exists. Number exists. All right, cool. So if that's the case, we just start messing around. Well, if the three numbers exist, let's just call it uh, A plus B plus C equals 31. All right, cool. So what that means is that since they are even numbers, right, that means that you can actually rewrite it because any even number, you can rewrite it as two times some other whole number. So for that case, let's just rewrite it. Instead of 2A, I'm just going to call it, uh, let's just do 2A prime or 1, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, and then the same thing we're going to do with B. It's going to be plus 2B1. Let's just do that. And let's just plus 2C1 equals 31. Okay, so the reason, this is just a notation, and that's what confuses a lot of people because it's open to however they wanted to name it, right? I just name it A1, B1, or C1. Some people A prime, B prime, C prime. Some people are gonna do X, Y, Z, it doesn't matter. And that's why it gets complicated because you're trying to figure out what the heck are they talking about? But hopefully this makes it a little more clear. The concept is the idea that A, B, and C are even number because we're assuming we're just assuming that, yeah, it does exist. And that there's gonna be three even numbers such that you add them together to become 31. We don't know what they are, but we just know they're even. The idea of even number is that every time, well, if it's an even number, you can always rewrite it as two times some other number. And that's what we did here. So instead of just this A, which is an even number that we don't know, I'm just gonna rewrite it as two times a to A1, right? Which is basically two times some other number. And same with B and same with C. And I'm just naming it this so that it's a little obvious which one it is. Well, if that's the case, I can factor out the two, right? What I would have is just two, and it's gonna A1 plus B1 plus C1 equals 31. Now at this point, you're basically done. Can you guys see why? Here, because we have two times, and the sum of this is just some number, is saying that this is even. There's no way that this number is even. 31 is not even. It's simple as that, right? And that's a contradiction. Okay, well, I know this is true, right? Because we just made this assumption. I know this is true because we know that they're even numbers. So we can rewrite it like this just from the sheer fact of even numbers. And then this makes sense because I can definitely factor out the two, right? Why not? But the idea that all of a sudden that means that 31 is an even number doesn't make sense. So if I can do this, I can do this from this, right? The only thing that didn't work or might have caused this problem is this right here assuming that the three number exists. So since this is the only thing that could potentially have caused this contradiction, this is wrong. And therefore, the opposite must be true. Opposite or opposite, right? Negate each other. That there does not exist three even numbers such that the sum is 31. All right, let's look at one more. The sum of two even numbers must be even. That's what we want to prove. So, we're gonna assume the opposite. Assume that the sum is gonna be odd, right? The sum can be odd. All right, cool. Well, if that's the case, let's just see what happens. All right, well, I have two even numbers. Let's just do A plus B, right? And we're saying equals C. But the assumption is that this right here is an odd number. And I think you guys can sort of already see it. And if you can't, that's entirely fine. It's pretty amazing. So basically, it's very similar to the other problem, right? We're assuming that C is an odd number, right? Just by our assumption. We know that A and B is an even number. So if this is the case, that means I can rewrite this as 2A1 plus 2 
B1 equals C. Once again, C is still an odd number. Well, if that's the case and they both have two, I can definitely factor out two and I would have A1 plus B1 equals C. Boom, we have a problem here now. Two times some number. That's the definition, or, or not a definition, but a property of even numbers, right? So this right here is stating that C is an even number. But C is supposed to be odd. C can't really be even and odd, right? You really can't be one and the other. So that means there's a contradiction. Boom, contradiction. So I can jump from here to here. Just because we're talking about the sum of two even numbers, that's entirely valid. I can jump from here to here because I can always factor out two. They're both sharing a two. So if these are justified, completely justified. The only thing that could potentially have caused problem is our initial assumption. That means that the sum cannot be odd. It must always be even, right? We assume that it is odd and then we run into a contradiction. So only the opposite is true, right? That initial assumption must be false. So the sum of two even numbers must be even. All right, so there you have it. We're at the end of the video. Once again, this is only one of many, many different ways of proving something, right? This one is one I just quite enjoy because it's assume the opposite, run into some jimble jumble, and then all of a sudden it's like, ah, okay, that means my assumption was wrong. Boom, simple as that, right? But here's the thing. Yes, notice that even with all the examples that I've shown you, right, I did a lot of talking, and guess what? When I was doing proof, that's what I did. I wrote a lot. I wrote it in sentence. I wrote like exactly why something is something. In this case, I didn't write it all out, but it's basically, all right, I assume that C is odd, and therefore I can do this, and therefore I can do this. But when we see proofs in textbooks, in literature in general, sometimes in a homework, classwork, whatsoever, it's kind of weird because they don't write a lot, right? It seems like it's just one after another, after another, and after another. It's either working on the equation or itself, or it has little weird symbols. And here's what I want as, I guess you could say a sneak preview. They have symbols like this, they have symbols like this, they have things like this, and a whole lot, a lot of other stuff, right? And then all of a sudden you look at all these weird symbols like what the heck is going on? Mathematicians are lazy, okay? These represent specific words or phrases. So in the future video, I'm gonna go over proof again, except for I'm not gonna really talk about technique, but probably break down certain I guess you could say proof statement to regular English, which is odd, right? Because I'm focused on math. But break it down to regular English so you guys can see that these interesting looking symbols, right, are nothing more than mathematicians' lazy way of writing specific statement. And just a sneak preview, such that. That's all this stands for, right? And so on and so forth. So thank you for watching this video. Hope you enjoy a little bit. Made proof not as scary as it might seem, right? Just one technique out of many, many, right? See you in the next video.